Let's see, how long is this review gone now? Jeez, nine pages. I'm summarizing as briefly as I can without ignoring major plot points, but it's really intricate. Lord of the Rings is a thick three volumes, but much of its length goes into elaborate description of scenery. I probably would have been done long ago if I'd been reviewing that. This is more like trying to cover the plot in Tales of Symphonia. Things keep changing at such a rapid pace that I have to take my time. Alright, so the boat blows up, and Ash awakens on a floating fragment in a sea of flames. While it's amazing that he survived it all, it's flat out bizarre that the whole Phoenix Trainer crew made it as well. After a brief fight with a Wraith Pokemon and Trainer, Ash and Merlin reunite with the party and ride Leviathan across the waves to the refinery. Once there, they split into two teams and comb through the refinery looking for the almighty Pokemon causing the hurricane. Team A discovers a diary documenting a rocket lab experiment that secretly took place on location. Team B discovers a bloody table on which the diary writer's dismembered body now lies. It's pretty morbid. I gotta pause here and compliment how creepy and intense Anastas made this place. The parties know that they could be jumped at any time by the demons who are well aware of their presence. The doors creak loudly, the lights flicker, there's a thunderstorm raging outside. I would guess this part was inspired by the movie Aliens, when Ripley's squadron of soldiers is sneaking through the infested complex. I also have to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech for providing such fitting music for this particular scene. It really does enrich the experience. Team B finds and plays the audio log of the head scientist, Brendan Bible. It seems Giovanni was attempting to make another Mew clone, not like the one that went rogue and killed Ash at the beginning, but one that would be completely subservient to its master's orders. The result was Serangel, which Brendan took to calling his daughter. When Giovanni tried to claim Serangel for himself, Brendan sold his soul to the Wraiths to keep her. The Wraiths then turned around and used Brendan to control Serangel. The result was the killer hurricane. Shortly thereafter, Mike discovers Serangel herself, hiding in a back room, cowering in the corner. She is utterly gentle and innocent, a stark contrast to her possessed master, who appears soon after. Brendan announces that he's kidnapped the members of Team A, and invites Merlin and the remaining force to find and free them. Meanwhile, in the basement level, Brendan's Pokémon inform the captured trainers that they're soon going to be eaten. Have I mentioned how awesome this fanfic is yet? This was probably my favorite part to voice, simply because I made Leech so hammy and over the top. Pity he only got like five lines. Hey, while I'm talking about my performance, I'd like to apologize for any names I mispronounced. I know I messed up Arcanine and fixed it later, but I've got this horrible feeling that I've been stressing Anastas all wrong. Anastas? Was that how it should have been this whole time? I based it off the name Anastasia, but I could be wrong. I just do this sometimes. I'll get a Pokemon name wrong like Lugia, Lugia, and then it'll grind on your ear every time I repeat the mistake without knowing better. Well, look, I'm providing you dozens of hours of free entertainment. You get what you pay for. Right, back to the summary and review. The remaining Phoenix trainers make it down to where Team A is being held prisoner, and waiting for Merlin is the Wraith minion, Mr. Darai. Here, he explains his own wish. When he was lost at sea, he bartered his soul to be reunited with his family once again. Once together with Mrs. Darai, the influence of the Wraiths must have rubbed off from him to her, because she also made a wish. She asked the Wraiths that Merlin's life be extraordinary, so that he might bring the highest honor to the name of Darai. There it is. The reason Merlin became the world's most powerful trainer, the reason he developed his own company and school for Pokemon Mastery, was demonic influence from the Wraiths. You'd think that they'd find a way to bend this to their own evil ends, right? You'd be right, except for the fact that there was another power in this world that influenced Merlin towards good. It is, of course, the namesake of his organization, the Phoenix herself. So while the race may have been behind all the calamities of the past five years, the person who should have been their greatest ally ended up becoming their most fearsome adversary. Mr. Durai's wish might have changed all that. When he lured the Phoenix Trainers into the refinery, he bent all his will into getting Merlin to switch sides. It would have made the race victory quick and complete. But then, of course, Ash leaps in and breaks the spell. 
And from there, the tide turns completely against the wraiths. Sarah Angel overcomes her mental block and kills Mr. Durai with her psychic force. Brendan rushes in and subdues her, but then Michael puts a bullet in his head. Overjoyed at being freed from evil, Sarah Angel takes Michael on as her new master. Once the Phoenix Trainers plant a bomb in the refinery, a panicked Wraith finally comes forward and confronts Merlin as a last resort. Everyone flees while Merlin holds it off alone, and once they're out, Sarah Angel teleports a half-dead Merlin back to the escape boat. She explains that she arrived just in time to see him kill the Wraith with his fire sword. And BOOM! Up goes the refinery in a mushroom cloud explosion. Celebrations all around. This would have been a good point for Phoenix Rising to end, if only for the sake of a happy ending. But there are still too many loose ends that need tying up. The biggest two go like this. A. There's been no actual raising of a phoenix yet. In fact, when I first read this, I interpreted the title to mean that the phoenix trainers had risen to the challenge. B. Gary faced both Ash and Merlin in a sword battle, and won. How is it possible, then, that Merlin single-handedly killed the wraith that gave Gary his powers? The answer to the second conundrum is simple. Merlin didn't actually kill the wraith. The Phoenix Trainers have a victory celebration at the nearest hotel in San Manuel, which involves drinking. Thus, Mike is slightly drunk when he retires to his room with Faith. The two of them share a romantic moment, and then Faith kisses Michael full on the mouth. That's when the vodka wears off, and Mike pulls back from her, shocked at what they just did. Faith is hurt by the rejection, and even when Michael struggles to explain that he loves her, just not like that, she takes it hard. Late into the night, she wishes that she were a human so that she and Mike could be together. Nobody is supposed to have heard her, but exactly the wrong entity answers the call. That can be arranged. When Mike wakes up, he finds the strange girl standing on the balcony just outside his room. It's Faith, in human form. She comes up to him, brimming with seduction, and attempts to proselytize Mike to the miracle-working race. Overwhelmed with fear at what's happened, Mike flees the hotel in terror. This, to me, is the most memorable moment in any fanfiction I have ever read. This story deserves so much more than an audio recording on some obscure YouTube channel. It deserves the admiration of a hundred thousand adult Pokemon fans, its own manga series, an anime movie, collectible figurines, and anything else an otaku millionaire could imagine investing in it. It is an injustice that garbage like Jeff the Killer and SCP-682 get slathered with recognition, while all the fans of Phoenix Rising could probably be counted on two hands. It's not a perfect story, I'm the first to admit this, but it is an epic worthy of song and praise. God knows I've done everything I can to bring it to light. Okay, so back to the story. The Phoenix Trainers are shocked to find Michael missing, with his room in shambles. Eventually, they figure out that he hopped on the nearest flight out of the country, and board a plane bound for Sierra Mana headquarters. This is also where Giovanni and Team Rocket are headed. Their reasons are unclear, but when Giovanni is momentarily detained by a local Phoenix Trainer, he lets slip a suggestion. There are some things that are best left as secrets, especially since you haven't been all that sure as to what side you're on. Perhaps he observed the shift in balance of power between the race and the Phoenix Trainers. Maybe he thought he'd switch sides and seek refuge in the Phoenix Trainers home base. Whatever his reason for being there, it doesn't appear to work out, and he's forced to retreat to his own Team Rocket building in Salt Lake City. I ought to pause here and give the remaining Phoenix Trainers the benefit of their names. But I won't. As you know, the important ones are Merlin, Ash, Mike, and Freeman Bible. Freeman's important because he ushers in the basic plot for the rest of the story, kind of like Merlin did at the beginning. The others are just there for show. Not that I'm complaining, it's a good show. Michael's plane bursts into flames just as it's preparing to land, and the local Phoenix trainers fly to the rescue. Take note that they've now conducted operations on the road, on a train, on a cruise ship, and on an airplane. These guys have been around. They manage to land the plane safely and retrieve Mike's unconscious body. By nightfall, the rest of the Phoenix trainers have gathered at the round table and they discuss their options. There's a feeling of overall helplessness amongst the group, and Merlin leaves early on, head down in shame. 
Remember how at the beginning of the story, Merlin was presented as this godly character that could do everything up to and including raising the dead? Here we are now, three quarters of the way through the story, and he's being depicted with his head in his hands, pleading that the others not look to him for answers. He's just a man. This show of weakness and insecurity runs counter to the Marty Stu profile, and relatively speaking, Merlin hasn't been that far above the others in being a manly badass. More importantly, in spite of how plot-driven this story is, Anastas found the time to give Merlin a personality. You know you're invested in a character if you miss him when he dies. With the Phoenix trainers at a loss for how to deal with the wraiths, all they can do is wait for Michael to wake up. But that night, Demon Faith returns to claim Michael for the wraiths once and for all. This provokes direct intervention from the Phoenix herself, Ho-Oh, and she raises Mike from his sickbed to confront the Wraith Emissary. In a thundering voice, she declares that the Wraiths have gone too far, and she's coming for them. The time has come for Phoenix Rising. Roll credits! That needs to be on a mug or something. To me, this was the pinnacle of the epic that Anastas had woven. Not the actual confrontation of gods at the story's end, this. It reminded me of the scene in Battle of the Five Armies, when Galadriel drives Sauron out of Dol Guldur. She speaks in that commanding bass voice, and the evil is forced to go. This occasion called for similar tactics, and I'm pleased with how the end result sounds. I can believe that Faith's minion died of fright from the Phoenix.